During this workshop, you will hear a lot about the caterpillars that do the damage and the adults and recognizing the adults. You've just heard about the eggs of Lepidoptera. Now we will discuss the pupae of Lepidoptera. I will introduce the different types of pupae, talk about the morphology, how you can identify the sexes, and then mention some pupae recognition of pupae of economically important groups. First of all, when you find a pupa, you have to identify the type because you might have a beetle pupa or some other kind of pupa. If it's an exorate pupa, the legs, the appendages are free from the body. And this is common in the beetles. In the very primitive Lepidoptera, you have an exorate pupa. In the higher diptera, you have inside that puparium of a housefly. If you open it up, there's an exorate pupa inside. Now the obtet pupa, in contrast, have the appendages fused with the body, and this is true of most Lepidoptera and things like mosquitoes and midges and the other lower diptera. There was a term introduced years ago called pupa incompleta. That's a usable practical term for identification. A pupa incompleta has less fusion of the abdominal segments. They're more movable. And the abdominal turgites typically have spines that when the abdomen wiggles, which it can because it's freer, then those spines force it forward. Imagine if you're in a sleeping bag and it's very tight and you want to get out. If you can wiggle your abdomen and if you've got something on your back that will project you forward, you can get free of that sleeping bag and that's exactly what the pupae do. They push forward out of the cocoon for emergence and yet they will have at the tail end some hooks that will allow them to latch onto the silk and the moth can escape, leaving the pupal skin behind, extruding from its pupation area. Now the major groups with a pupa incompleta with these spines on the abdomen include the Taneidae, Gracilariidae, leaf miners, uh, Zygenoidea, the carpenter moths, uh, Cossoidea, and the Tortricidae. In the pupa completa, the first four abdominal segments are fused. They don't move. There's no spines on the abdomen. So it has to have a different strategy for, for emergence of the adult. The complete pupa is found in Eponymium portentoidea, Galicioidea, Pyroloidea, and the Macrolepidoptera. For the pupa, there's morphological terms that have been applied to the various parts and in fact you can see many of the appendages on the outside of the pupae. Depending on the family, some appendages are visible and some may not be. In addition, if you have a pupa, you can determine if it's a male, shown here on the left at the bottom, or a female, shown here on the right. In our laboratory, we will have pupae for you to examine to determine if it's a male or female. So when is a pupa not a pupa? When an insect molts, there's two steps. The first is called apolysis. That involves separation of the two cuticles. And then you have ecdysis, in which the old cuticle is shed. And this is true for caterpillars. It's true of pupae. So what happens is that you can have one thing happening occurring and the other not. You see that in the growth stages, you have first apolysis, the separation away, and then the shedding, the ecdysis. But look, when you get to some pupae, you have apolysis, and you see the butterfly within. Apolysis has happened, but ecdysis hasn't. So is it a pupa, or is it an adult? And technically, it's an adult that's still enclosed in the pupal skin. Many times overwintering pupae are these ferrate adults. They're enclosed, they've undergone apolysis, you can identify the species, but they haven't shed that pupal skin. Here's another ferrate adult. This I think is a pyroloid alma. This, you can see the adult inside, the compound eyes, it's intact, but it hasn't shed the pupal skin. Some of the groups of economic importance, Noctuidae, Eribidae, uh, have some characteristics of the pupa that are important to learn. In the Lamentriini and Arctiini and Noctuidae, pilifers are absent. Now these are anal analogous to what 
formerly we were called mandibles, the little nut, uh, little lobes, and you can see them in these images. The pillarfers are absent, but they're present in the pyraloidea and in butterflies. The mesothoracic wings do not extend beyond the fourth segment of the abdomen in these three groups, Noctuidae, Lamentriani, and Arctiani. Relatively short wings. This is in contrast to Galicioids, Epidemutoids. Look how long those wings are, extending far beyond the fourth segment. In these three groups, the labial palpi are usually present and well-developed. You can see them as just little crescent-shaped slivers right in the midline. These are absent in Nododonidae, Geometridae, Sphingids, Saturnids. So those labial palpi, they're not visible in, there are exceptions, for example, Copatarsia do not have exposed labial palpi, and Copatarsia, one of the genera that we look for. But most of the noctuids have these exposed labial palpi. There's also a distinct cremaster, which is absent in Saturnids, Sphingids, and Lasiocampids at the tail end. Little hook-like process. To distinguish noctuidae from Lamantriani and Arctiani, a microscope is needed, but you have these veruci. These are these flat, low-growing panacula on which groups of CD arise, and the CD on the pupa are around, arranged around scars of the larval veruci, rarely in Noctuidae, but always in Lamantriani and Arctiani. To separate those two gr groups, the labial palpi are usually visible, maxillae, never more than two-fifths of the wing of the wings, then yes, it's a Lamantriani with those characteristics. Visible labial palpi, maxillae, never longer than two-fifths the length of the wings. So here's a way we can get down to whether or not it's a pupa of a gypsy moth. Tortricity, they're typically small, as true of most of the micro moths. And we have the abdominal segments movable one to four, so it's, it's flexible. You see a dorsal and lateral views with the spines extending out from the segments. Uh, there can be two rows on most of the abdominal segments. This is also true of Ciseids and Cossidae. There's only one row in Taneidae. So you can identify the pupa of a Tortricids, uh, although you may need to be careful that it's not a Ciseid or Cossid. The maxilla, including proboscis, is present, and that's indicated by the arrow in the diagram. This is absent in Cossidae, so we, we've excluded Cossids. The spines on the tenth venter, or the venter of the tenth segment, are absent in Tortricidae, but they're present in Ciseidae. So now we have a way for identifying any pupa of Tortricidae. Two families, Pyralidae and Crambidae. Adonal segments are not movable, Pillifers are present. The maxilla, including the proboscis, are often long and reach to the apices of the wings. And you can see those structures going all the way to the ends of the wings. The pyraloidia, of course, include uh, some of the important pests that we uh, are on guard in, at our ports and looking for. And so identification of the pupa within a plant product can be important for its detection. Gilichioidea, these have segments one to four that are fused. They're not movable, they don't have pillifers, and the mesothoracic wings extend beyond the fourth segment. All of these characteristics will give you an indication that you may have a Gilichioid, but there are exceptions and there are families that uh, can be misleading. Gilichioids have labial palpi seldom visible. The frontal clipial suture is distinct. So these two characters can separate out the Galicidae from many of the other families. One of the references that I used in this presentation was, uh, and Christy and I used, was the classification of Lepidopter based on characters of the pupa by Edna Mosher in 1916. What is remarkable is that after her seminal work, no one has continued and has brought this to modern day to do an analysis of pupae for 
the present day Lepidoptera in North America, and it is badly needed. The book by Malcolm Scoble is an excellent reference of general information. In contrast to North America, there's a two volume set on the Central European species, the pupae, with hundreds of images, hundreds of species treated, something that we uh, don't have. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions?